The Perks of Being a Wallflower, Part 4, April 29th, 1992. Dear friend, I wish I could report that it's getting better, but unfortunately it isn't. It's hard, too, because we've started school again, and I can't go to the places where I used to go, and it can't be like it was, and I wasn't ready to say goodbye just yet. To tell you the truth, I've just been avoiding everything. I walk around the school hallways and I look at the people. I look at the teachers and wonder why they're here, if they like their jobs or us. And I wonder how smart they were when they were 15. Not in a mean way, in a curious way. It's like looking at all the students and wondering who's had their heart broken that day and how they are able to cope with having three quizzes and a book report on top of that. Or wondering who did the heartbreaking and wondering why especially since I know that if they went to another school, the person who had their heart broken would have had their heart broken by somebody else. So why does it have to be so personal? And if I went to another school, I would never have known Sam or Patrick or Mary Elizabeth or anyone except my family. I can tell you one thing that happened. I was in the shopping mall because that's where I go lately. For the last couple of weeks, I've been going there every day trying to figure out why people go there. It's kind of a personal project. There was this one little boy. He might have been four years old. I'm not sure. He was crying really hard and he kept screaming for his mom. He must have been lost. Then I saw this older kid who was maybe 17. I think he went to a different school because I had never seen him before. Anyway, this older kid who was really tough looking with the leather jacket and long hair and everything, he went up to the little boy and asked him what his name was. The little boy answered and stopped crying. Then the older kid walked away with the little boy. A minute later, I heard the intercom say to the mom that her boy was at the information desk. So I went to the information desk to see what would happen. I guess the mom had been searching for the little boy for a long time because she came running up to the information desk. And when she saw the little boy, she started crying. She held him tightly and told him to never run off again. And then she thanked the older kid who had helped. And all the older kid said was, next time, just watch him a little fucking better. And then he walked away. The man with the mustache behind the information desk was speechless. So was the mom. The little boy just wiped his nose, looked up at his mom and said, French fries. The mom looked down at the little boy and nodded and they left. So I followed them. They went to the place where the food stands are and they got french fries. The little boy was smiling and getting ketchup all over himself. And the mom kept wiping his face in between taking drags off her cigarette. I kept looking at the mom, trying to imagine what she must have looked like when she was young. If she was married, if her little boy was an accident or planned, and if that made a difference. I saw other people there, old men sitting alone, young girls with blue eyeshadow and awkward jaws. Little kids who looked tired, fathers in nice coats who looked even more tired, kids working behind the counters of the food places who looked like they hadn't had the will to live for hours. The machines kept opening and closing, the people kept giving money and getting their change, and it all felt very unsettling to me. So I decided to find another place to go and figure out why people go there. Unfortunately, there aren't a lot of places like that. I don't know how much longer I can keep going without a friend. I used to be able to do it very easily, but that was before I knew what having a friend was like. It's much easier not to know things sometimes. And I have french fries with your mom, and to have french fries with your mom be enough. The only person I really talked to in the last two weeks was Susan, the girl who used to go with Michael back in middle school when she had braces. I saw her standing in the hall, surrounded by a group of boys I didn't know. They were all laughing and making sex jokes, and Susan was doing her best to laugh along with them. When she saw me approaching the group, her face went ashen. It was almost like she didn't want to remember what she was like 12 months ago, and she certainly didn't want the boys to know that she knew me and used to be my friend. The whole group got quiet and stared at me, but I didn't even notice them. I just looked at Susan and all I said was, do you ever miss him? I didn't say it mean or accusingly. I just wanted to know if anybody else remember Michael. To tell you the truth, I was stoned in a bad way and I couldn't get the question out of my mind. 
Susan was at a loss. She didn't know what to do. These were the first words we had spoken since the end of last year. I guess it wasn't fair of me to ask her in a group like that, but I never saw her by herself anymore, and I really needed to know. At first, I thought her blank expression was the result of surprise, but after it didn't go away for a long while, I knew that it wasn't. It suddenly dawned on me that if Michael were still around, Susan probably wouldn't be going out with him anymore. Not because she's a bad person or shallow or mean, but because things change and friends leave and life doesn't stop for anybody. I'm sorry I bothered you, Susan. I'm just having a tough time, that's all. Have a good one, I said and walked away. God, that kid is such a fucking freak. I heard one of the boys whisper when I was halfway down the hall. He said it more factual than mean, and Susan didn't correct him. I don't know if I would have corrected him myself these days. Love always, Charlie. May 2nd, 1992. Dear friend, a few days ago, I went to see Bob to buy more pot. I should probably say that I keep forgetting Bob doesn't go to school with us, probably because he watches more television than anyone I know, and he's great with trivia. You should see him talk about Mary Tyler more. It's kind of spooky. Bob has this very specific way of living. He says he takes a shower every other day. He weighs his stash daily. He says when you're smoking a cigarette with someone and you have a lighter, you should light the cigarette first. But if you have matches, you should light your cigarette first so you breathe in the harmful sulfur instead of them. He says it's the polite thing to do. He also says that it's bad luck to have three on a match. He heard that from his uncle who fought in Vietnam. Something about how three cigarettes was enough time for the enemy to know where you are. Bob says that's when you're alone and you light a cigarette and the cigarette is only halfway lit. That means someone is thinking about you. He also says that when you find a penny, it's only lucky if it's heads up. He says the best thing to do is find a lucky penny when you're with someone and give the other person the good luck. He believes in karma. He also loves to play cards. Bob goes part-time to the local community college. He wants to be a chef. He is an only child and his parents are never home. He says it used to bother him a lot when he was younger, but not so much anymore. The thing about Bob is that when you first meet him, he's really interesting because he knows about cigarette rules and pennies and Mary Tyler Moore. But after you've known him for a while, he starts to repeat these things. In the last few weeks, he hasn't said anything that I haven't heard from him before. That's what made it such a shock when he told me what happened. Basically, Brad's father caught Brad and Patrick together. I guess that Brad's father didn't know about his son because he caught them. Brad's father started beating Brad. Not a slap kind of beating, a belt kind, a real kind. Patrick told Sam, who told Bob, that he had never seen anything like it. I guess it was that bad. He wanted to say, stop, and you're killing me. He even wanted to hold Brad's father's down, but he just froze. And Brad kept yelling, get out, to Patrick. And finally... Patrick just did. That was last week, and Brad still hasn't come to school. Everyone thinks he might have been sent to a military school or something. Nobody knows for sure about anything. Patrick tried calling once, but when Brad's father answered, he just hung up. Bob said Patrick was in bad shape. I can't tell you how sad I felt when he told me that because I wanted to call Patrick and be his friend and help him, but I didn't know if I should call him because of what he had said about waiting until things got clear. The thing was, I couldn't think about anything else. So on Friday, I went to the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I waited until the movie had already started before I went into the theater. I didn't want to ruin the show for everybody. I just wanted to see Patrick play Frank Furter, just like he always does, because I knew that if I saw that, I knew he would be okay just like my sister getting mad at me for smoking cigarettes. I sat in the back row and looked on the stage. It was still a couple of scenes before Frank and Furter enters. That's when I saw Sam playing Janet, and I missed her so much. And I was so sorry about how I messed everything up, especially when I saw Mary Elizabeth playing Magenta. It was all very hard to watch, but then Patrick finally came on as Frank and Furter, and he was great. 
He was actually better than ever in a lot of ways. It was just so nice to see all my friends. I left before the movie was over. I drove home listening to some of the songs we listened to those times we were infinite, and I pretended that they were in the car with me. I even talked out loud. I told Patrick how I thought he was great. I asked Sam about Craig. I told Mary Elizabeth that I was sorry and how much I really loved the E.E. E. Cummings book, and I wanted to ask her questions about it. But then I stopped because it started to make me sad. I also thought if anybody saw me talking out loud when I was alone in the car, their looks might convince me that the something that's wrong with me might be even worse than I thought. When I got home, my sister was watching a movie with her new boyfriend. There isn't much to say other than his name is Eric and he has short hair and is a junior. Eric has rented the movie, had rented the movie, and I shook hands with him. I asked him about the movie because I didn't recognize it, except for an actor who used to be on a TV show, and I couldn't remember his name. My sister said, it's stupid. You wouldn't like it. I said, what's it about? She said, come on, Charlie, it's almost over. I said, would it be okay if I watched the end? She said, you can watch it when we're done. I said, well, how about I watch the end with you and then I can rewind it and watch up to the point I started watching with you. That's when she paused the movie. Can you take a hint? I suppose not. We want to be alone, Charlie. Oh, I'm sorry. To tell you the truth, I knew she wanted to be alone with Eric, but I really wanted to have some company. I knew it wasn't fair, though, to ruin her time just because I miss everybody, so I just said goodnight and left. I went up to my mom, and I started reading the new book Bill gave me. It's called The Stranger. Bill said that it's very easy to read, but very hard to read well. I have no idea what he means, but I like the book so far. Love always, Charlie.